pleasure to welcome back Hank Dykstra. This is his second of six visits to Cornell. He's uh, this is under the auspices of the Mary S. P. Upson Visiting Professorship to the College of Engineering. Uh, he'll be here this visit through May 13th, and so I encourage any of you who are interested, stimulated by his, his work, to, uh, to c contact him. Uh, uh, the email, by email, I think it's best. Uh, and uh, so, uh, Hank is, first of all, the, a few words about the Upson Visiting Professorship. I want to thank those faculty who have supported this, this effort to bring Hank here for a, an extended uh, set of visits, uh, six visits over three years, and uh, this is, uh, he's very uh, interdisciplinary in both his background, I think, and his, his applications, but I think CAM is one of the most natural homes for him. He has brought, internationally known for bringing dynamical systems, in fact, I'd like to thank some of the dynamical systems that he learned when he was here at Cornell 25 years ago. Uh, to the uh, nonlinear physical oceanography, and from there to some interactions between the uh, oceans and the, and the atmosphere and climate dynamics. So the overall theme of these uh, six visits then is, is mathematics and climate, and some of the topics are a phenomena of climate variability, toy models, uh, mathematical approaches to understand climate variability, and applications to specific phenomena. Last time he uh, spoke about El Nino in another uh, venue, the uh, Fluid Dynamics uh, Seminar Series venue. Stochastic approaches to climate dyna in climate dynamics, predictability in weather and climate. So uh, if you have particular interest in this, we want to make this as, as, as interactive as possible f uh, through these visits. So I think it's now time uh, with, with the second visit to, to open this up a little bit more and, and you know, give me your feedback. Uh, I should say a word about why I'm hosting Hank. Uh, I don't work in climate uh, dynamics, but it turns out that uh, we worked, uh, Hank was here as a postdoc, we worked together, and it was fluid dynamics and dynamical systems, and he basically ported the dynamical systems over to this, this very successful uh, uh, application uh, in, in, in physical oceanography. So Hank's background includes his MS and PhD degrees in applied mathematics from uh, Groningen in the Netherlands, University of Groningen, and he's presently chair of physics and astronomy department at Utrecht. <laughs> Please, Hank, yeah. I won't say any more. <laughs> Thank you very much, Paul. Oops. Thank you all for coming uh, on this uh, Friday late afternoon uh, to hear about uh, ergodic theory and climate. Uh, it's been a pleasure uh, being back again. I mean, I still have a bit of a jet lag. I came on. On Wednesday, after Wednesday evening here, so this is not the best time for me. But uh, I want to uh, talk today about uh, quite a different topic than I did uh, last uh, time, and uh, it's, it's work uh, which is just been which is just in development. I have a first PhD thesis. I have actually a booklet here for people interested by Alexis Tantet, who was a PhD student of mine and defended last Monday in the middle of defended his thesis. You know, in the Netherlands, they, they get printed really as a nice booklet, and uh, they really fit nicely in your, your bookcase. Um, so this is also work with uh, Mika Chacron and David Newlin, who are at uh, Atmospheric and Ocean Science in, in UCLA, and Valeria Lucarini and Frank Lukeit, who are at the University of Hamburg. Um, so I'll give one example, eventually, of a climate phenomenon which is based on work of Valerio. And uh, mostly the theory has been developed with uh, Mika Shakun and, and David Neely. So what, to come back at, uh, from last time, I, I gave a talk uh, in the middle of October, I think it was October 16 or 17, um, and showed this diagram also where this is a, a artist view, we call it, of, uh, of climate variability. Now what you see is, um, say, a, a hypothetical spectrum, right? This is, this is a a spectrum where the energy in certain frequencies is, uh, is plotted, and you see very, say, low period, uh, very long periods of time, like 100,000 years, which is associated with the ice age cycles. And then you see that uh, two very short term fluctuations here in three to seven days, which are the, the mid latitude, say, high and low pressure systems. So that's really the weather at mid latitudes. And uh, what, what, what I said last time is that you have, say, basically three types of, of climate variability phenomena. One is sort of a red background, where you get higher amplitudes of variability when you go to low frequencies. And then you have the really easy ones, which are the, 
one year and one day, which are really forced into the system by astronomical forcing. And then there are the more difficult ones, which are related to what we call internal variability. So th those arise really through instabilities in the whole climate system. That could be in the individual atmospheric system, like in those shorter time scales. In the ocean system here, those time scales here, ranging from, say, a few years to, to hundreds of years, to really, uh, say, the process involving uh, land ice, which is in the ice ages here. And uh, what I did last time is focus on one particular phenomenon, like the El Nino Southern Oscillation, and try to explain it by sort of dynamical system at a certain model and try to understand where this time scale comes from and where the pattern comes from. So what I want to do today is, is more general. Uh, of course, we're not interested in sort of individual, say, trajectories in the climate system, also not in the weather. We're mostly interested in, in probability density functions. So you're interested in, in the weather also. This is how they, how they actually make weather, say, projections or weather, weather predictions. They start from an ensemble of initial conditions, then run the model forward, and then eventually get a probability density function of a certain variable at a certain time. And this is basically uh, what also, if we talk about climate projections, right, where we project the climate into the future, there also you have a certain forcing scenario, which is an increase of CO2 and all kind of other, say, forging agents, which you might sort of have a clue on how to project those and you look at the statistics, basically, of the whole climate system in the response to that particular forcing. And so this is also a question how to characterize stability of the climate system. Is that whole, say, probability density function, can that actually rapidly change in time with respect to the forcing? Now we know also that uh, climate is a highly turbulent uh, system, highly chaotic system. There are subcomponents like the atmospheric the mid latitudes, which are highly chaotic. We know this very many, say, the positively happen exponents, and they also say more slower systems which are, that don't have that property, but if you look at in sort of the whole climate system, it's very uh, chaotic, and, uh, and this is a, a challenge to look at, say, how the statistics would change with respect to change in forcing. So what is the more general formulation? Well, this is, that you can always write, say, a, 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 a climate model where you have a very large state vector, which would include, say, ocean, atmosphere, land, ice, uh, sea ice, vegetation, for instance, carbon cycle process, you can always write it in, in this particular way, where you definitely have some external forcing, which is related to the, the forcing which comes from outside of the Earth, which right? so could be solar forcing. So, for instance, the daily variations, uh, seasonal variations, astronomical variations, which are associated with change in the orbital parameters of the Earth, and what you do mostly is that you, you will not sort of uh, look at all those components, but you will only look at a few of those. So you will use always sort of a reduction of the state vector. And what happens then is that, that, that you consider, for instance, the CO2, which is considered in many climate models, you consider it as a forcing to the system. This has a, has a reason, because the change in CO2 is much faster than the natural processes. And so it ends up basically here as a, as a forcing into your deterministic part of the equations. And then you have an unresolved process, which you don't want to resolve, very small scale process. What's the subscript T mean? T is just time here. But it's, it's not a time derivative or anything? No, no, no. It's just a stochastic process uh, as a function of time. I'll, I'll use that notation from now on. And D and the D in the front? This is, this is just a stochastic differential equation, where this is the drift, right? And this is the diffusion. Bond. And xt is stochastic process, and this is a bounding, so a vector value bounding motion. Yeah. And you have you have unresolved processes which you you can represent as noise. It's it's quite modern at the moment to represent, say, many of the processes which you cannot resolve anyway, right? I mean remember we go from a ten thousand kilometer scale. And for instance, in the ocean, the smallest, say, relevant scale is in the order of meters to, to centimeters. And so you, you, you're always left with a problem of representation. And you can do that, say, in terms of deterministic, say, parameterization, you call them, but you can also do it in a stochastic way. So this is basically where you end up with. And this is what you want to study with dynamical systems method, particularly when you look at statistics 
you're interested in, say, how densities of trajectories, how they were propagating time. So if you sort of categorize the dynamic systems approach, I would say they're basically on one end, uh, we look at very, say, laminar type of flows. This is a particular example where you have a, a Taylor Gratt flow, right? Um, this is from Abraham Shaw, a very old book on dynamical systems, which you turn, you crank up the, uh, the rotation, uh, say, of the inner cylinder. And then you see that uh, in, the, in the sort of early stages, you have a very laminar flow, and you, you have transitions which are associated with really elementary bifurcations. And then uh, eventually, you end up in a very turbulent regime, and then you ask questions on the long-term behavior of ensembles of trajectories, or uh, say invariant measures, transfer operators, and, and particularly where you're interested, this is also in the climate system, you're interested in evolution of correlations between variables. This is basically what gives you a lot of information on the behavior of the system. So this is a bit my, my motivation for the climate system. I hope to summarize, I'm interested in behavior of densities of trajectories in a certain climate model, which can be stochastic, which can have stochastic elements in there. So how do you handle that? Well, this is an example. Uh, this is a, a, a particle in a, in a heat path. So that gives you the uh, stochastic noise here in the, in the second variable. You have the, uh, say, the uh, damping here, which is a uh, damping gamma. In beta phase, the inverse of the temperature. I really, it doesn't really matter. Sort of this, this physics of the, this, this variable, uh, apart from that you see that it has this oscillatory, I mean it has this harmonic uh, signature in there, so it's an oscillatory motion which is damped with stochastic noise. This is basically the, all the elements in there. And uh, you're interested in if you take a, a single trajectory, it looks like this, right? So it fills up this uh, space here, and P1, Q1. And uh, what you're interested in basically is in ensembles of trajectories. So this is a, a box where you initialize, say, this is in QP space, you initialize, uh, take any initial condition, and then you propagate this density, you propagate it forward, and what you will see is that eventually you get to an equilibrium density here. This is a Gaussian density, and uh, uh, in this system uh, you get this sort of equilibrium density is indicated by rho infinity here, and it looks like this, it's a, it's a Gaussian density, you have a linear, say, stochastic system, which has a Gaussian density uh, distribution in equilibrium. And uh, we call, uh, just to remind you what we call as a gothic system, is that basically when you, you take, say, the average right, over the phase space of a certain observable, which is G, so a very general observable, that you can always sort of, it's equivalent to taking a very long time series and just taking the average. This is what we call an ergodic system, where you really can substitute, say, phase space average by time averages. So ST here is the, is the STX is the motion of X along a trajectory, right? You measure the observable there. So um, now, if you look at correlations, and this will come back in the climate later on also, we're interested in this correlation between two observables, F and G, as a function of time. And uh, you can write it as this. So if you, uh, so this is basically the, the you have a delay time t, right? Where you look at one observable, and you look at the time t later of another observable, and you just compute, say, the correlation between both. If you would write this in terms of time series, you get sort of the very familiar, uh, say, correlation back, which you use in statistics when you take a single time series. Now, what often happens in, say, chaotic dissipative systems is that this time series, this correlation uh, goes to zero when t goes to infinity, and that's how we call, we call this dynamical system mixing. And for the, for the particle in the box, also you see this correlation, and this is the, say, the correlation, outer correlation of Q1. You see also that it has this oscillatory behavior. First, that's related to the frequency of the particle, how it oscillates. And then you see the decay in time of this correlation here of the envelope, and it seems to decay with a, a really a sort of an exponential here. When you look at the, uh, the, the spectrum, you see a, a peak here at this, say, uh, of course, this oscillatory frequency of the particle oscillates, and you see a peak here. And you can, you can ask yourself the question, where does this decay scale lambda here? I, I, I plotted here as a real part of an eigenvalue, and this is an imaginary part of the eigenvalue. You can actually compute this eigenvalue also from the, from 
this model. And it says something about the decay of the correlations. So that's the real part here. And the imagined part says something about where the peak is in the spectrum. Now you can imagine that if you are in the, in the climate system, you, you're looking at statistics of the climate system, that it's very important to know, say, how this say, spectrum will look like in the system and how the correlation will decay. So you can ask, can you, is there a general, say, methodology to determine, say, this decay of correlations in a very high dimensional system? And this theory is there. Uh, of course, it's, it's, I, I'll present it now a bit uh, from an abstract way, but not too abstract. I mean, it's, 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 uh, it's, it's, um, it's very explicit, actually, how, how I present it. So if you have a, a stochastic system, uh, general, so I left out the T now as a, as a for stochastic process. This is just a vector x, of a say vectorial stochastic process. F is the uh, say the, the drift here, and uh, sigma is the sort of stochastic uh, dependence uh, of the. Uh, so so if, if sigma is depending on x, you have state dependent noise. If, if it's independent, you have what we call additive noise. This is a, a Brownian motion. And uh, what you always can write down for this type of system is you, you can write down, say, the evolution equation for probabilities, which is the fock planck equation. If you leave out, say, the noise sigma here, you get into a blue wheel equation. So this is just a, a statement of conservation of probabilities when you integrate it in time over a certain ensemble of, uh, of trajectories. Now, K is here uh, what we call a generator. So it's basically the right-hand side here operator on the on the, on the density, and uh, you may ask yourself, no, this is a linear equation in rho, so that's, that's very nice, but this is now a, a, if you look at every degree of freedom x here, it will give you a spatial dimension in the fock planck equation. So you will see that you will be very quickly, so if, if you have, an, so even for the particle in the box, you have two dimensions, you end up with a two-dimensional spatial fock planck equation, and you run out of, pro of really solving this numerically very quickly in, in spatial dimensions. So okay. Just a general question yep. in terms of following the flow. Are you more going to be interested in tracking the particles, or are you thinking of this more abstractly as just propagation of states? Yeah. Like the weather at some point, or are we yeah. actually going to track a particle in, in time? Yeah. In the weather, you would have, uh, as they do it actually also in weather prediction, you take, uh, they, they try to determine initial condition as best as possible. For but initial condition is a distribution of velocities and temperatures, not a distribution of particles, right? If you say the uh, weather at well, one instant in time is some. Yeah. There's no, we just look over space and look at all the velocities and temperatures and humidities and so on. Yeah. And we don't care where any individual particles are. At a later time, there's a distribution of velocities exactly. and temperatures exactly. and humidities. Yeah, exactly. And there's no particle tracking no. per se. Per se. No. And that's the no. point of view you have That's here. the point of view we have now. We're not yeah. interested in the individual trajectories. You're just interested in, say, probability density fix and how it will evolve in time. Yes. So that your example was just schematic before about the particle tracking. Um, well, here also we looked at this was the eventual density also, right? In time. Okay. So this is basically this picture here sketches what what we're interested in. Okay. So basically, you're looking in the evolution of the densities and eventually interest, of course, in the equilibrium densities. Yeah. And the, the, this this sort of evolution of density would be modeled by this Fock-Planck equation. Okay. Also in the part of the box, you can write down for this case it is two-dimensional. So the state vector x will here be p1, q1, right? So you get a two-dimensional, basically, a fock planck equation, which you can still easily solve in one yeah. OK, so this is the diffusion tensor, right, which you need uh, to look at, uh, say, the diffusion terms in this uh, fock planck equation. As I said, it's a linear equation, but it's, it's uh, prohibitively difficult already to solve in more than, say, four dimensions or so. So it's, it's not very practical. But uh, what you can do is uh, this has formal solutions, uh, rho, which is uh, called a, a transfer operator, which is semi-group also. And you can write it as a e to the power tk, formally which k is this generator. And uh, what you can do is you can now relate basically the correlation functions so that, that the next few slides will be how to relate basically the correlation function to the eigenvalues of k. This is the, the problem which comes up. And so how, how it's been done, you, you, you define this correlation function here. I, I, I use now a little bit more abstract, say, a measure here. But if you, in the previous case, the measure is just this rho infinity times dx, right, in the, in the part of the box. And then this is basically the, the correlation function. Again, you, you have a delay 
S T, uh, T delay T here in the in the correlation between F and G. And uh, what you can what you can do is the adjoint. You can what is it's done is the defining the adjoint of the uh, transfer operator, which is the Copan operator, defined like this. And then you can write down also the correlation function in terms of the transfer operator. So this is say using uh, I think just the standard inner product here on X. Now. This transfer operator and the Copan operator, they have, they have a, a spectrum. So that's given here. The eigenfunctions are this psi k, f, which are basically f is meaning forward, and b is meaning backwards. And this, this bar means, uh, say, a complex conjugate. And then you basically uh, can compute, say, the eigenvalues uh, zeta k here of the transfer operator. And you can relate them, and it's due to a spectral mapping theory, but you can relate them basically to the eigenvalues of the generator. So the, the idea behind this is as soon as you have, say, and you have the transfer operator, right, and you can later we're going to approximate it, of course, that you, from the transfer operator, you get an idea on the, say, you can compute the eigenvalues here of the, of the generator. So how does this... Uh, Correlation then appear where you can uh, expand, say, f and g in terms of these eigenfunctions. And then you can express also the correlation in terms of, say, this uh, eigenvalue of the, of the generator, this lambda k. And it looks like this, where this is this inner product uh, in, in this measure u. And uh, what you see from there is, is several things. One is that, uh, of course, when you have an ergodic system, eventually you have an invariant density or an equilibrium density at t going to infinity. And this means that uh, you have an eigenvalue one of this transfer operator. Right? So the density is transferred, and so this equation, the, the, the eigenvalue of the uh, generator is zero. And uh, the second thing you see that if you look at, say, the, the dominant terms here, that basically this, this uh, gap here, <coughs> which is the distance between the, uh, say, imaginary axis and the, the second eigenvalue, controls basically the decay of the correlations. So this is one connection between the eigenvalues of the <coughs> generator and the correlation decay. And another one is take, if you take the uh, Fourier transform of the correlation function, you get the spectrum. You basically see that uh, you get a, a connection also, you get what we call Lorentzian spectra here, Lorentzian shapes. And they have peaks at uh, imaginary of uh, lambda k, and you have half bits of the real part of lambda k. So basically, once you know the eigenvalues of the generator, yes? Does this work only for linear system with no. Brownian motion? No, this works for non fully nonlinear systems. What if the uh, motion is not Brownian? Then the full oh. equation is going to be quite different. Yeah, no, and this is only Brownian noise. Okay. Yeah, you know, if you go, that, that, that becomes a uh, different, okay. different, different way of work and of okay. process. But I think um, in terms of climate, um, I, would, I wouldn't sort of immediately have motivation to include jump process, for instance, in, in this particular in, on climate variability. But, but, you, but there might be problems where, uh, yeah. At some point, are you losing the explicit time dependence of the forcing in the fusion terms, or is that still the operators, the transfer operators? Um, you mean explicit time for? Or like the forcing. Okay. It seems yeah. like your semi group is assuming it's not. Connected. You mean here that F depends on T? That's. Um, yeah, but in general, it, it could be for the Fock Planck equation, F could be dependent on time. There's no restriction there. But it looks like in the next slide, yeah. you have the semi group. Doesn't that assume it's not dependent on time? No, that's that's quite. Yeah, I, I should mention that. Here, here it's for uh, looking at equilibrium, same autonomous systems. Yeah, because if you look at, say, non-autonomous systems where you, you have to modify this. There, there's a way out, of course, there when I come back to that later at the end, is that you, you take sort of what you call sliding window approach, right? Where you sort of take sliding windows and really use the non-autonomous theory in this, in this window uh, where you shoot that it's autonomous. Because the, the forcing changes usually slowly compared to, say, the, the dynamics of the system. Yeah, no, that's right. So uh, the spectrum here, and this is a sort of a picture of an example where you just have, when you, once you compute, say, the spectrum of this, these are the eigenvalues here, real part and imaginary part of this, uh, say, transfer operator, you have an approximation, the red ones here, the red is the, uh, for this example, is the 
the peaks in the spectrum computed uh, through this sort of formula. And then you see that every peak here you can interpret as an eigenvalue of this generator. So this is really nice. And also the half lids you can interpret in terms of the real part of this eigenvalue. So the, the summary is, as, uh, once you get sort of a good approximation of the eigenvalues of the generator, you, you have basically quite some information on the decay of correlations in the system and also on the, on the spectral peaks. So just to give you an example, uh, the, the stochastic half is a, is a very prototype example. So you see that this is the formulation here. Uh, Q is the, the noise variance here, and uh, W1, W2 are, are independent here, bound in motions. And uh, when you look at, say, the uh, say very stable, say, uh, um, mu is, uh, oh yeah, I must say, the, the half bifurcation occurs at mu is zero here. So when you go uh, mu, say, very smaller than zero, it's, it, it, you have a, a, a stochastically excited but damped oscillation. So you still see a density here uh, around zero. And when you go really to, uh, say, higher mu, you see eventually you see this periodic orbit, which is, of course, a bit distorted by noise. You see that appearing in the, in the density. So these are equilibrium densities uh, for the different cases of, uh, of mu. There's actually a theory of this. There's a whole book on this. I, I, I didn't know that, but there's a book on from uh, Jasper on, on this whole theory. Uh, it's more physics from the statistical physics point of view, but uh, many of the examples are sort of given there. And also the half application, you can actually compute this spectrum of the generator. You compute it analytically. Uh, so how does it look like? Well, this is uh, just just from so solving the Fokker-Planck equation. For this example, you can just compute this spectrum. So this is at, at very uh, negative mu, mu is minus 10. And watch what happens when you get to, so you see this sort of pyramid structure of the spectrum. And then when you get to positive values, you see that's a more parabolic shape you get in the spectrum of this, of this generator. And of course, this has, has a lot of consequences for the, for the eventually the spectral peaks in, in the problem. Right? So if you have a uh, so very subcritical, this is this, this density, your outer correlation here this is outer correlation of y, uh, decays very quickly, oscillatory. So the, the green ones here are, are computed from time series, and the blue one is just from the exact solution. Uh, it's also numerical, but it's, it's not from uh, one single time series. It's really determined from the uh, solving for the Planck equation. And then you see here also, you see the, the spectrum here. Uh, this is this, this uh, pyramid type of shape. And then you see these are the dominant say, eigenvalues. And you see also the spectrum. This is the spectrum. Uh, the red one is according to the focal Planck equation. And then the black one here is according to just by analyzing a time series. And you see that uh, basically you have the peaks really at the positions of this, this eigenvalues. So this is a, a very nice correspondence. When you get to, say, the uh, uh, supercritical case, you get the density looks like this. And you see also that the outer correlation now is, is uh, hardly decaying in this case, and also the eigenvalues, you see the, the, the cl eigenvalues closest to the magic axis, you see that every peak, so every harmonic in the system is related to an eigenvalue also of this generator. If the equations you wrote down were circularly symmetric, yes. uh, the diagram, the figure isn't. The noise is independent, right? W1 and W2 are independent. Yeah. Should be. Yeah. No, I, I know I know where this comes from. I mean the the, uh, the densities are not I mean are for a system with a half bifurcation, yeah. not exactly from these equations. Yeah. But it should be silver symmetric. Yeah. You can actually compute the density uh, also uh, explicitly. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. So um, but again, the, this correspondence holds, right? I mean, there's not uh, uh, between these eigenvalues and the, and, the, and, the, and the spectrum. So to uh, to illustrate this, I, I think uh, I, I had also an example from uh, from atmospheric, say, flow transitions. But I guess that's a bit, um, yeah, a bit 
quite, quite involved. So I've, I chose another example, which is the, uh, the snowball earth problem, uh, where you have a, uh, this, is, this is under discussion, it's, it's uh, quite a debate also, but uh, there, there have been quite some indications that the earth was uh, sort of ice covered, mostly ice covered, uh, in several periods uh, between 800 and 600 million years ago. And uh, there's a book on this by uh, Gabriel Walker, if you're interested. It's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it sketches all the evidence in a sort of very uh, uh, nice, nice way. Um, I could tell a lot more about it, I, I, I want I maybe it's best, maybe I, I do it later and use a toy model also to look at this snow water phenomena. But one of the uh, important process has been the uh, isolbedo feedback, which you, you all know, I suppose. Uh, where you have, uh, when, for instance, sea ice extends uh, a little further, um, you have a, a higher reflectance of sunlight, but which basically causes eventually the earth to be colder, and that's uh, also increasing, say, the, the ice extent. So this is a very strong feedback, uh, also now uh, mostly responsible also for uh, the sort of decay of the Arctic sea ice uh, due to due to increase of, uh, of carbon carbon dioxide in the, in the atmosphere. So how do you uh, how do you now look at this uh, problem? Well, one thing and uh, what we did was uh, to work with uh, a, a climate model which is called PLASIM. It's it's a very nice tool, so also for students. So if you uh, want to do anything with climate, it has a GUI, right, where you can actually you, uh, you you can set the resolution of the model here. This is we use here T21, which means uh, you see a sort of a five degrees or so, five, six degrees resolution there. So it's a very rough resolution, uh, but you don't resolve any jets or so, but just uh, you, you, it's basically the, the overall mean atmospheric circulation is, is captured. But you can increase resolution also in the atmosphere. It has a, uh, an ocean mixed layer, so it's it really coupled in the influxes to the ocean, but not dynamic, so there's no ocean currents. And it has also what we call a thermodynamic sea ice model. So that's a, a, a model really where you just uh, the sea ice is respond to heat fluxes instead of really the ice dynamics. This is uh, actually a, a quite high dimensional climate model. It's, I mean, depending on, uh, this is five level here, T21, and you have about 10,000 degrees of freedom with the, the variables in, in the system. And it has uh, also chaotic behavior. I mean, you can look at the other experiments and uh, that's a, say, a positive Lyapunov response. It's, it's not something you remember here, but this is the this is the, uh, the URL. If you type class in, it has a separate website, so you can, you can find and download it, and you can run it very quickly. This is also very, <coughs> very nice. So, what do we do? Well, what you do is basically here is uh, you vary the solar constant. So this is the uh, the basically the the uh, say variable which controls how much heat is received in, in shortwave radiation by, by the Earth system through the sun. And uh, what you can do, you can run this model for 10,000 years, so you really have a, a very long time series. And you look at, uh, for instance here, the mean surface temperature of the model. This is a global model. It has coolography, etc. So it's, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's not a, what we call a general circulation model, but it's not a baby model like a toy model. It really has uh, substantial, say, uh, processes in there. And what you can do is you, uh, you run for a number of, say, solar constants, you run it into equilibrium. So you don't change the forcing time. It's really equilibrium, say, structure. But you look at how the equilibrium change when you basically go, say, from uh, when you decrease the solar constant. And what you do is, uh, what eventually, you, you, you find that uh, after some solar constant and solar constant get low, you suddenly get a transition. And you get into a, a snow-covered earth for this model. So you really have, and it it's stays here for a while. And when you reverse the whole process, or you increase the solar constant, then you get, the, uh, say, what we call the snowball states up to a certain, say, solar constant, and then you get back to the, uh, say, non-ice covered state. And in this state, there is some sea ice in, in the in the poles, but not really over the whole globe. So this looks really like a, a cell node bifurcation, right? If you look at it like this, but it's not because it really is a highly chaotic system in the atmosphere, which basically undergoes a transition and goes to a different chaotic system when you're, when you're sort of at this uh, low values of the solar constant. Now, uh, of course, people are interested in, in saying, can you 
for instance, can you devise a early warning type of signals, right, for those type of conditions? I mean, there are several of those in the climate system. This is the for this normal Earth, but there are also say similar problems where you have a collapse of the Atlantic Ocean circulation. What I want to I talk about on Tuesday. There also you have a very chaotic system, and, and you have a, 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 a say an external agent which changes, right? A parameter which changes, and then you have also collapses there. And what you're interested in is suppose you, you, you go very slowly in the forcing here, whether you can sort of detect an early warning signal of the upcoming transition. This is what many popular literature is about on, on early warning. So here what you can do is look at, say, the uh, autocorrelation. Now here we, there's two variables we looked at. One is the, uh, say, fraction of uh, northern hemispheric mean sea ice cover. And the other one is the equatorial mean surface temperature. You take an equatorial strip and then you look at the, the mean temperature there, and you just look at the, uh, the autocorrelation. Now this is uh, semi-log plotted, so any exponential decay you see is linear. And what you see when you go to, uh, this is the solar constant here, when you go to, uh, say, small solar constant here, so you, you, you go from along this branch here uh, to this, uh, so every, every point would be in equilibrium, but you go eventually to lower solar constant, you see that, um, there's hardly any oscillatory behavior in the uh, here in the in the in the because these, these correlations are very low of course. So in this in this you don't hardly see any oscillatory behavior, and you see also that uh, this autocorrelation decay actually uh, decreases when you go to uh, say to this transition point, and it's in both variables. So this hints also that you can sort of find this by looking at say the transfer operator and or reduce transfer operator and then look at the eigenvalues of the generator. So how do we uh, estimate this transfer operator? Well, as I said, you have this uh, high dimensional space where you have to solve the focal plug equation, that's hopeless. So what you do, you take, uh, say, observables, say H1 and H2, which are, in this case, the northern hemispheric sea ice cover and, and our, say, mean surface temperature, including surface temperature, and you look at, say, the trajectories projected in that particular subspace. So it's a two-dimensional space here. And then what you look at, uh, you, you, you look at boxes, so you define a grid over this, over this density here, and then basically what you do from a very long time series, you compute, say, uh, transition probabilities of, say, uh, going from one box to the other box. So basically it's the, you take a, a delay time tau, and you look at, say, the, uh, what's the probability of the observable being in a certain box on the condition that it was in the previous box, say, uh, at time t0. And this, this basically, this transition probabilities, they approximate this transfer operator. So because they really have the propagation of the density in time. Once you sort of have approximated the, uh, this transfer operator, you can look at the eigenvalues of this, right? So those are the zeta t's, and then look at the eigenvalues of the generator used by taking the logarithm. And so you can determine, say, just eigenvalues of the uh, generator just by uh, this procedure. So this has been worked out by Delnitz and Jung and also by Schickroon. Uh, this has quite some technical elements. I mean, how you choose a tau, to delay that tau, for instance. How long do you have to have a time series, right, to approximate this in a, in a way? Uh, you have also problems in terms of uh, uh, if you have a reduced system, your reduced system might not have a semi-group property, so you, you, you have non-Markovian elements. This all has to be uh, looked at in, uh, in very much care to really look at, say, the estimates here of the, uh, of the transfer operator. Uh, this is all in the thesis of election, so I'm interested in this, this the technical detail. I'm not going to talk about this, but it's, it's filling up, say, uh, quite, a, quite a bit of the thesis how, how to do that. Um, so, how does this, for this uh, plasma model, how does it look like? Well, here you see that, um, here you see the bifurcation diagram again. Uh, you have the solar constant versus the, the, the surface temperature. And these are the densities, equilibrium densities. So these are just determined by, uh, say, the eigenvectors of eigenvalue zero, right? the generator. You get this, uh, say, densities in this, say, reduced space. Again, the sea ice versus uh, equatorial mean surface temperature. And you see when you get to the, uh, to the uh, transition here, you see that the, that the uh, probability shifts to, say, higher sea ice fractions, right? This is, uh, and becoming non-Gaussian also. So higher nonlinearity uh, affecting, say, the, uh, the, uh, the 
the equilibrium density. So how do we uh, did it for the plasma model? Well, uh, we used 25 by 25 boxes uh, spanning five standard deviations. We have a lack of one year. Uh, again, the robustness of all this uh, has been studied also by Alexis. Uh, use also 50 by 50 boxes. And what you find, and this is, this is I think, very nice, what you find is that uh, the eigenvalues here are, are uh, you see that the leading eigenvalues here have hardly any, have no oscillatory components. So that really shows you this, this sort of really steady decline of the correlation function. And then you see when you get to, uh, say, from 1275 to 1265, so you get to the transition that this gap, which is between the eigenvalue zero and the, and the second eigenvalue, indeed closes up. And so this decay rate, uh, one over rarely of the real part of lambda two, also basically increases, and the slow shows you the slowdown of the system when you get this this transition, just like it was a simple outline, but it's not. I mean, it really is a high-dimensional system where you see this transition. And these are the decay rates. So again, this is the uh, the lambda two. Maybe the blue one is the most to focus on. The blue one here. Uh, which you see indeed when you go to s uh, s lower solar constant, uh, you get actually it gets to, to zero. And then you, here's the estimate also of the uh, the outer correlation. So the, the, the two variables, right? So you have cross correlations and outer correlation of the uh, say the, the variables when you look just from this on the time series, and you see that uh, this this blue crosses they match up uh, reasonably well here with the uh, with the eigenvalues determined. So you see that indeed the time series analysis sort of confirms that indeed these eigenvalues show you uh, basically, even in this reduced space, uh, show you basically the, the critical slowdown that you get through the, uh, through the critical point. Yes? I think I might have missed something. Is S the property of the sun? So yeah. Yeah. So, the, yeah. The free, so what's the frequency that S changing? Like no, S is just a constant. So, but it's power, so it's watts per meter squared, but is that due to solar heating? Yes. Okay. And this is just the, the insulation which, which reaches the Earth on a Per, per unit per, per, per square meter. I was just curious. Yeah. You, I mean, so we have statistics on that too. How that changes? Um, yeah, that changes by 0.1 percent or so due to the solar cycle. But it's a very tiny amount okay. compared to what we do here. Okay. okay. Yeah. Slightly like larger. It's it's. Sorry. But slightly like larger over like hundreds of millions. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. And, uh, but you mean on a long time scale? I mean, it, it varies. The, the, the insulation varies seasonally. But but on the long time scale, the, the total variation is still very small. The annual mean. Small compared to this range. Yeah, small compared to this range. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. There, there's of course the 11 year solar cycle in there, which it, 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 that's what you meant. Yes, yeah. varies a bit. Yeah. But it's it's 0.1 percent or so of the solar cycle. Yeah. Yeah. So, so yeah, we consider this a stationary, particularly in this, this sort of exercise, right? It's not really very really realistic, this is just an exercise to see whether you can determine, say, from the spectrum, whether you can, whether you can determine properties of the time series or the a priori. So, uh, yeah, this is why I wanted to end. I think it, uh, I had another example, as I said, uh, on uh, atmospheric floatings. We have also an example in El Nino, maybe I do it another time, people are interested in that, but this is the simplest example uh, to illustrate it. Um, I hope I've shown you at, at least that uh, when you do this, say, reduced transfer operator uh, reconstruction, you can get uh, very useful information on, uh, on climate variability intrinsic because you, you get the spectral peaks. And you can, uh, say, get information on stability of, of, of changes like, like this, say, uh, snowball earth transition. And uh, it also helps, I didn't show that, but it also helps in design of reduced models, right, where you have the representation of dynamics in reduced space which corresponds to what happens in the, in the full model. So um, yeah, we, we, we think that uh, the ergodic theory is, is a nice approach. And uh, we're all looking now in, in terms of whether you can use, for instance, this reduced transfer operator in, in some very uh, in climate models. And the, the art is there to get uh, to construct uh, the right to uh, subspace. This is, of course, not so trivial. In this example, it's a bit very easy because you know, it's only a few processes, but when you you're looking at, say, uh, a, a full-blown climate model. Uh, you're interested in certain transition phenomena. It's not so easy to come up with the right variables uh, because you easily lose the semi-group property, and then your spectrum doesn't tell you anything. 
development. So it's still full development uh, uh, what you can do with these techniques. Thank you very much, and uh, happy to answer any questions. So maybe I should mention before we take open up for questions that uh, details about the uh, the talk on Tuesday that that Hank mentioned. So this is, uh, I believe, an, uh, an application in some sense. So that, uh, yeah. And this is Tuesday on at 12 noon, 178 Roads. It's part of the uh, Cornell Fluid Dynamics Seminar Series, and and the title of the talk on Tuesday is the Physics of the Separation of Ocean Western Boundary. I changed it a bit, but it, it, it's uh, on yeah. the ocean circulation. Yeah. So ocean circulation in, in uh, both El Nino and, and Atlantic no, and it's Pacific? More, it's more in the Atlantic. More in the Atlantic, yeah. okay. Yeah. Question? There's a question? Yeah. So could you just uh, explain what's the physical intuition by taking this um, correlation as a measure for how, how quickly you converge to equilibrium and what your fixed observable G is supposed to be in, in your case? Or? Yeah. Why do you take so, that as opposed to? So the example I, I looked at Plasen, right? When you look, your, your observables are in this case, say the uh, sea ice extent fraction and the and the, the mean equatorial temperature. So you really have clear observables, and you're really looking at you want to look at, for instance, the autocorrelation of of one variable only, right? And that will tell you, I mean, the K will tell you how close you are to criticality in this case. So that's why you're very much interested in this correlation. Because when you when you get to the to the to the point where you have this transition, you, you really have this autocorrelation is, is decaying least. And this is this is the point you want to know. So so you again get it just as you would do normally with dynamical systems where you have Jacobian matrix and you would determine the eigenvalue close to bifurcation. You can do it now by looking at say for the whole density. You can look at now from looking at the eigenvalues of the generator, but then in the reduced space. An important characteristic of um, attractors is their fractal dimension, or different kinds of fractal dimensions that determine, in part, um, how long you have to wait in order for initial conditions to undergo recurrence. Yeah, yeah. Um, in using these, these methods on um, models of different scales, uh, how are the results affected by the dimension? How is it easy to determine when you look at trajectories that are long enough to get answers that, that represent the, the state of this condition? Yeah, yeah, that's a question how long you have to make the time series right to, yeah. to have this work also. Yeah. 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 It's difficult to, to have any general say because you, you don't have a lot of a priori knowledge when you have all the time series. I, I don't know how to estimate, say, how long the time you have to be to estimate an eigenvalue here from the generator, for instance, accurately enough up to a certain so Presumably, people do tests where they take series of different lines yeah, exactly. yeah. and see how quickly things change. Exactly. This is, this is the way to do it, but not no a priori estimates or so. Yeah. I mean, that might be possible, but uh, I don't think that's there. And, and what, do, what do those tests, what sort of results do you get in those kinds of tests? Um, well, the tests are mostly about robustness. So when you take a certain length of time series, you look at the eigenvalue, you take twice as long, you look at the eigenvalue, and then you see that it has hardly changed, so you're happy then. Yeah. Um, yeah, it doesn't learn you much, except that the first one was long enough. You could do a lot of systematic, maybe, in terms of where it breaks down or so, but you haven't done that yet. But, I mean, that, that could be But yeah, it would be useful to have a more a priori measure on how long you have to. But it will depend also on the observables you take. Some decay differently than others, uh, although the attractor is the same. Right. It's, it's, uh, yeah, open problem. Correlation is a very good indicator, of course, for the first two moments. Yeah. But uh, it tells very little about the trajectories. Yeah. Uh, so, particularly if you're interested in extremes, uh, yeah. correlation is yeah. a very weak yeah. measure yeah. of telling you what to extreme. Yeah. So, that would not apply in that case. Any alternative? For, 
from this point of view, you mean? No? Well, or any other method. Well, of course, there's a lot of work on extremes. Oh, but say, very right? extreme, true, but, sure. uh, but it's a totally different animal. Yeah, exactly. Right. I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't fit it directly yeah. here. Yeah, that would not work here. Uh, because very weak. That's yeah. The correlation yeah. is terrible for extremes. But, but, yeah, but, I mean, you might get even more detail, say, information on the statistics, maybe from, I, I don't know, maybe you could do something with extremes here. I mean, you get quite a, you get more details on the, on the probability distribution. So you can you get you get the, the full probability distribution. So that tells you something about the but but tails also. If, if you know the full probability, then you have to solve the focal Planck equation, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that uh, right. that is not going to work. No, no. Yeah. But you, you but you, you you determine certain properties of the focal Planck equation in the reduced spaces. So you might do something with the extremes, maybe. In the, in the, in the but the tails. It, it, what determines right. the tails here? Yeah, it, as you know very well, you have to solve focal Planck numerically. Yes, yeah. so you are not going to get to the tails. Correct. Uh, now it depends really on how the tails would, in the reduced space, would correspond to the ones in the full space. But no, no, but I'm thinking even in the reduced space, yeah. if you are going to solve focal Planck numerically, yeah. it's very difficult to get the tail yeah, of the yeah, distribution. Okay. So that's what I'm saying. Okay. Yeah. Even for <coughs> 2D cases? Even for 2D problems? Okay. I mean, I, I, I guess you can do that. I mean, for the for the hop, you can do it pretty accurately. Well, if you have an analytical form, of course, yeah. you can the right example, many examples. Of course, in two D, we can get an analytical uh, solution yeah, yeah, for yeah. the uh, stationary focal plank. Yeah, 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 then you have it. Yeah, but yeah. I'm speaking but if you, you have to do it numerically. Yeah, okay. Uh, could be, yeah. Alex, I have a question about the Brownian motion. That thing. Yeah. You told us that capital H was some sense the dimensional reduction due to the unresolved components of the system. Yeah, yeah. What's the justification why it all reduces the Brownian motion? What's uh, the intuition of why it should give me something Brownian like? Yeah. Well, you know, I, I think the justification is that, that I, I would have, but I might have me that, is that uh, you you model things which are generated by Navier-Stokes equations, right? uh, and and uh, so you, you would write a form in Stratonovich way right, where you use a Brownian motion to, to represent this. There's no, as I said, there's no a priori sort of information that you have jumps like in finance or so. Right? You, you need to include those. But, but you, this you is partly related to my question, right? Yeah. So the jumps could be related to let's say discrete switches. Another type of statisticity yeah. which is common in many yeah. applications yeah. would yeah. be a hybrid switching system. Yeah. Yeah. And that is like the jumps. And this could be yeah. a type of an event, random event, which switches your global dynamics into a different mode. Yeah. Yeah. So there, there are of course, yeah, there, are, there, there is some kind of switch behavior in terms of eyes or no eyes, right? That, that's somehow something which you indeed uh, you could model that way. I don't think people have done that uh, yet, at least to, to represent that. I mean, for now, it's mostly representing eddies, for instance, like ocean eddies and, and uh, gravity waves in the atmosphere. So those type of processes, but uh, not really those sea ice yet. Yeah, might be interesting to do that. I mean, this is very uh, underdeveloped still in climate, uh, stochastic uh, representations. Uh, there, there are a few groups doing that to really apply it also. But yeah, it could be interesting to look at it. Maybe people have done it in the, now it comes to mind, maybe have, they've done it in sea ice uh, indeed, uh, John, some people at Yale or so, it comes to mind. They, the they equation should not be much more different, no, right? No, you no, have no, just no, a coupled no. system. Yeah, so uh, it would be coupled, actually. Yeah. The focal Planck equation is getting much more difficult. Yeah. It becomes an infinite series yeah. if you have jump processes, yeah. if you have a compound process. Yeah. So this might be much more difficult to do, indeed. Yeah. But you could still look at uh, oh, yeah, the absolutely. simulation. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. The uh, 
driven Hoff bifurcation. And the Brownian driven Hoff bifurcation is a very yeah. nice example of illustrating it. If one did the same thing with a saddle node, uh, drove drove that by Brownian motion, yeah. what would the eigen, uh, what would what would the spectrum and the eigenvalues look like, and compared with what was observed? From yeah, I mean this is related to the comment yeah. that this is not a hop, this is not a saddle node. This is yeah. actually much no, more. No, I know, I know, but the saddle node you can do analytically also. That's yeah, because yeah, sure. Who can do just a real eigenvalues? Yeah, yeah, sure, which are sure. But similar to what you saw in the plasma. Yeah. yeah. So the, the, it would look very similar to the reduced model that, that yeah. for the yeah. full system. Yeah. 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 Okay. So it's tempting then to say, in some sense, this is a yeah, exactly. Yeah, 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 that's right. Yeah, it's <laughs> some way, but yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I mean, it's not a cell node. It's such. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Right, right. Now, of course, in physics, it's, it's of course you have this, say, very highly sort of fluctuating atmosphere. And you have this very large scale sea ice albedo feedback, right? Yeah. So that, that, that draws and all the other degrees of freedom sort of okay. along. I see. In that sense, you can see well, ah. it's, yeah. it, it, you could maybe average, right? Maybe yeah. over, right? Yeah. Right. Now, in this model, it's not so easy because you, you don't have the real time scale separation or so, but you could maybe average and then, and then look at it from uh, in the average system, it would look like a certain amount. But, uh, yeah, also, that has not been worked out yet. Anything else? Anybody else? Good. There are refreshments uh, next door and, and talk on Tuesday. Yeah.